Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, Town of Lincoln Council Chambers this evening. I'm gonna call the meeting of the uh, Planning Committee of April 9th, 2018 to order. I'm just gonna go through a quick roll call of the councilors and staff that are present this evening. To my far left, start at the very end of the table, Councilor McMillan, then Councilor McPherson, then Mayor Easton, and then to my left as well in staff, we have uh, Matt Bruder, who is the Associate Director of Planning and Development, and then Kathleen Dale, who's the Director of Planning and Development. And then on my immediate right, I have Julie Kirkalos, who's our Legislative Coordinator and Acting Director of Corporate Services slash Clerk. And then we have <laughs> Councillor Foster and Councillor Timmers. And in the back row, we have a full complement of staff that leads into the gallery, um, starting at my closest point here. We have, uh, from our Human Resources uh, Department, Jacqueline Buchanan. There's a very long list here, I'm sorry, and I just don't want to miss anybody. We've got uh, Fire Chief Greg Hudson. We've got Walter Neubauer from our, plan, our Public Works Department. He's the Manager of Technical Services. We have the CAO, Mike Kirkopoulos. And then we have Sarah Ann, from, uh, who's the Associate Director of Recreation, Culture, and Special Projects from Community Services. And in the gallery, right at the back, we have Carrie Beatty, who's a Senior Communications Advisor. Paul Diani, who is our Economic Development Officer. Hopefully I haven't missed anybody. Are there any declarations of interest from the committee members this evening? Confirmation of the agenda this evening. Any changes anybody on committee would like to make? Very good. First thing we are going to uh, go into this evening is our delegation uh, section, we, seeing we have no public hearings this evening. So the first person we'd like to call upon this evening is Ted Gillespie, who's the president of Victoria, Ho Victoria Homeowners Association um, for the delegation re respecting report PL 1819. She's the second person delegating, so both at the same time, that's absolutely fine. Please, please. Okay, so just make sure you're, the little red light is on on the on the microphone because everybody wants to hear. Okay. Oh, I don't see a red light, but I think you can hear me now. Can okay, you hear perfect. Me? Anybody who can't hear me, raise their hand. <laughs> Well, thank you. Please go ahead, Ted. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good evening, uh, everyone, and, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity uh, to speak with you this evening. I truly believe, and we believe in our community, that the best results come from a joint cooperation between all the affected parties, and certainly that's something that I hear time and time again from you in the community meetings we've had and, and throughout the, uh, the time that we spent together on working on this project. Um, I come to you this evening as both a resident of Victoria Shores for 15 wonderful years and also the president of the Victoria Shores Homeowners Association. So again, thank you for inviting us to the meeting. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, two people who've done a wonderful job in creating this secondary plan. Matt and uh, Kathleen, uh, you've done a spectacular job in creating a draft secondary plan uh, for the Prudhomme's development that, if it's followed, and I hope it will be, it will be a beautiful uh, uh, development and it will all make us all proud of the development. So I look forward to seeing the, the fruition of all the work that you've, you two have done on this project. So thank you very much for that. However, and, and there's always a however, um, there are a few issues that uh, we still, we believe still need to be addressed. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about three of these issues and Francine was gonna be talking about another one of the issues as well. Um, the first, and I, I, I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but the first and most important to, to me and more than 95% of the residents of Victoria Shores and the surrounding Victoria Avenue community is the road connection between our community and the new development. Uh, for the last 12 years or more, uh, 
Um, our community has told the town that we do not want a vehicular road connection between our community and the new development. Uh, you told us at, at, uh, at the beginning of this session of uh, this secondary plan that an emergency road would enhance the safety and security of our community and the, and the new residents of the Prude Homes redevelopment. Um, almost all of our community um, now accepts the wisdom of this emergency road. So the emergency road is something that we, we hear and we see as, as, a, as an important thing for the development. Um, I did test the time to drive from the location at the, where the road's gonna be to the Prudhomme's redevelopment, and it takes only about three minutes to drive from the, uh, if, you, if you had to take a car around instead of going through the, the, uh, the road, it would only take about three additional minutes. Um, we also accept and support uh, the benefits of a walking and cycling connection between our communities. Throughout your report, you talk about making it a walking and cycling and, and people-friendly community. We support that, and we do think that a walking and cycling connection would be a good thing and don't object to that at all. Um, <coughs> We've told you many times that we do not or need a road except for emergency medical services at every one of our community consultations. That's been a, something that's come from our community and there's, I see a number of people in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the back row that are from our community as well. We presented you a petition um, about three or four months ago signed by most of our residents and it was about 98% of the people said they didn't want a road. In addition to that, more than 140 of our voting residents sent letters to our councillors, to the mayor and to Mr. Kapopoulos saying uh, that we didn't want the road. So we have, we have tried to communicate completely with that. We don't want a vehicular connection between our communities. The most recent draft of the secondary plan is moving uh, somewhat in the direction that we, we like to see. Um, it does say that there was still, it still calls for a local road connection, not an emergency road, which, uh, which is not something we're very happy about. Um, but there is some additional wording on page 77 of the report, and I'm gonna quote the report. Uh, a connection between the Prudhomme site and the Victoria Shores will be maintained in the context of an interconnected, complete communities and to provide access for the provision of emergency services. Um, the design, of the connection will include measures to dissuade, that's an important word, vehicular traffic other than emergency medical services. We do request a slight wording change to that. We accept most of it, but if we, uh, if we would like to see a connection between the Prudhomme site and the Victoria Shores will be maintained to provide access for the provision of emergency services. The design of this connection will include measures to prevent <coughs> vehicular traffic other than emergency medical services. So instead of the uh, dissuade, we would like that word to be changed to pr prevent. Um, secondly, we're very concerned about the plan expansion of the lorry pumping station. Remember, this is, this, these are our houses. This is where we live. This is where many people spend all their time. There's a lot of retired people there. We're concerned about the, uh, the tearing up of our streets. We're already gonna be putting up with the noise and disruption of the redevelopment of Prudhomme's right beside us. To have our streets torn up for, the, for putting additional sewer mains in is, is something that we really don't want to, want to hear. Um, also, the pumping station is located adjacent to the Prudhomme's Creek, the little creek that runs, uh, I, I think it's a very long creek that runs from, from the top of the escarpment all the way down. Um, <clears throat> any overflow or failure of the pumping station will allow sewage to flow directly into the creek and into Lake Ontario, and that concerns us a lot. There's always been, a, there already have been a couple of instances where this has happened. So whatever happens, we want to ensure that that doesn't happen, to have all of the sewage from a huge development next door and have a leak in that sewage and going into the lake on Lake Ontario. It's right beside uh, the Victoria Shores Park, which is a well-used park. Uh, a lot of people like kids swim there, a lot of people have their kayaks and canoes and sailboats there, and we'd sure hate to see raw sewage going right beside a beach that's well-used by our community. Um, as I understand, the, uh, the Prudhomme's Creek is currently under review by the town and the Conservation Authority for looking at long-term flood, flood plain mapping. We would hope that the um, pumping station and the, the final decision be made after the impact and after we look at the impact of the long-term study. I'd sure hate to see the pumping station and the wells in the pumping station be within the flood plain. Uh, the study should be considered before the plans are finalized. Uh, and also, as I understand, upgrades to the infrastructure from Prudhomme's to the pumping station will be the responsibility of the town, the costs, and, uh, and the, the costs of the upgrades to the pumping station and beyond will be the responsibility of the region. I'm a little concerned about the impact that would have on our tax dollars. Why should we be paying for a service that we don't, uh, is not required for our community? Why can't 
the new pumping station be constructed within the new development and the cost borne by the, by the cost of the redevelopment. Um, uh, finally, the, the, in the latest version of the secondary plan, there was a major change on the area um, at the end of Victoria Avenue, the corner of Victoria Avenue and, uh, and uh, Verity Lane, the northeast corner of Victoria Avenue and Verity Lane. Um, the change was from a four-story low-rise building, and now it calls for a 10-story multi-use facility. And th this concerns us. Uh, um, uh, but it, it seems to, uh, we were shown plans that the low story development originally, the maximum four stories, aside from the lack, there was no la there was no discussion about this, there was no input asked from the community. This happened after all the community consultation. Um, we also think that it is in conflict with the vision statement that's clearly stated in the initial uh, pages of the report, and it says that a height strategy that includes low-rise buildings at the east and west ends of the site adjacent to Victoria Shores and other existing residential uses with a distinct transition in height. So it, there doesn't, it, this is located very close to a community that's got uh, single-story houses, and it doesn't seem to follow the vision of the overall strategy. So I hope we, we'll, we, we look at that. And in addition to that, uh, I believe that a 10-story building will disrupt the views of the lake and cause shadowing of the Victoria Shores Park in the summer afternoons. That's a 10-story building. Well, uh, right now, the park has get some shade from even the trees that are located there. This is a well-used park by kids and by other people, and I'd sure hate to see that all the afternoon sunshine be gone from the beach in that area. It's one of our very important beaches we have in the area. So I'd like to thank you this time for the time you've given me, and I, I'll pass it over to Francine to make uh, some comments. And please consider these issues as you finalize the secondary plan. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I just have some uh, considerations and concerns on behalf of the Victoria Shores uh, community. Um, one is in regard to the protection of the remaining trees. It is stated on your, your plan that that is a consideration. So we are hoping that that rem remains and that this, these two areas that are uh, noted as protection, uh, as we're hoping that they're protected because they do fall under the Niagara Escarpment Commission and the Greenbelt. And we're hoping that these areas can be looked after and protected for the bald eagles, hawks, owls, butterflies, and all the wildlife that is remaining there. Um, we also have some concerns regarding the graduated heights of homes from Victoria Shores to Prudhomme's. The homes that we have on the Dustin Street roadway um, are one and two story homes. Um, on the plan, it's, there's, it's proposed that there are two and a half story townhome styles built behind Dustin and some commercial areas as well. So we would just like to see that the graduation isn't too dramatic for the neighbors that have backyards in that in that area. Um, and also the concern of the buildings that are 12 and 18 stories. I don't know where you would have to go. I believe that you'd have to go all the way to Niagara Falls or all the way into Hamilton to find a building of 18 stories. I don't I don't believe there's any other building of that height around. Um, I'm sure our fire department is going to have to buy new equipment. I don't think they have anything at the moment that can service a height of 18 built stories. Um, so that's just another consideration. And I'm sure we're going to have to have a new fire station located somewhere. I don't know exactly where that would be. Uh, to have all the residents in, in this neighborhood. Um, again, uh, just another issue um, in regards to the, the pumping station. It's just a concern that we have really nice boulevards and shrubs and trees in these boulevards in our neighborhood. And if if those our roadways are, are going to be um, dug up for the, the new infrastructure, will we have those replaced? And I didn't know if there's anything, um, as you know, that there have been some basements flooded in the past with the existing pumping station. And hypothetically, if there is another issue with the redevelopment 
um, of this little pumping station um, to accommodate all these homes. Is there something in the works that would provide so that nothing again floods the basements of the neighborhood? I don't know if there would have to be back backflow valves put into place or how that would be addressed to prevent this. That's all I have to say. Just some concerns that um, we've not heard yet about. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Ted and Francine. Are there any questions from committee? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to call upon Angela Bonamisi. Mr. Arians, are you joining Angela this evening or no? Okay, thank you representing IBI group uh, for the delegation respecting PL 1819. Please go ahead, Angela. Good evening, Chair, Councillors and staff. As you just said, I'm Angela with IBI group and we are the acting agent for FBH, who is the principal landholder holder of uh, the Prudhomme site. First off, we just wanna express our excitement to be approving the secondary plan tonight. Um, we've been following this process for over a year now, and we are very pleased with the attention to detail that has been given to developing this secondary plan. We are excited for this approval and can't wait to get a draft plan in in the next few months. Secondly, we would like to thank staff and council for listening to our concerns and allowing our client's vision to be presented to better understand um, some of the issues that we had and modifications to that secondary plan. So therefore we are comfortable with the secondary plan moving forward tonight. And if you have any questions, I can answer them. Thank you very much. Anybody in, on committee have any questions for Angela? Madam Mayor, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Angela, at uh, the last uh, public meeting, there was some discussion about um, trees and uh, indigenous um, plantings. And um, I don't see the lady here this evening that brought this up, um, but I'm hoping that um, with staff, with, by working with staff, that you will be able to resolve the concerns. I don't have any qualitative um, comments on what constitution constitutes indigenous, but there seemed to be quite a difference between her perspective, and she is quite an expert in this area, and the perspective of IBI, so I'm hoping that there will be some work um, to ensure that there's more compatibility with those viewpoints. I'm trying to remember, and I believe it was, uh, she wanted to keep all the locally native trees in the area, to which um, we are having an environmental impact study done, and two, we do have uh, landscape architects on this project who, and arborists as well. So they are familiar with, um, you know, keeping locally native and providing diversity. It's um, based on what they have said. It's not the best thing to have just locally native species. You do wanna provide diversity um, because if you have too many of the same species, as one tree, there's like the ash borer, which is kind of destroying all the trees right now that are emerald ash. So we I do have uh, people I on this project to ensure that locally native trees are maintained. I understand that. We deal with, as you know, a lot of um, comparisons um, with public perception and knowledge and expertise and what our experts tell us. I'm just asking that the door be kept open so that the public can have more input into this part of the project. And I think that that would be compatible with Mr. Gillespie's concerns and the concerns of Victoria Shores. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. At this point, uh, I'd like to call upon Jeffrey Breen of 4305 King Street uh, for the delegation respecting PL 1820 report. 
regarding a noise exemption request by Redstone Winery. Please go ahead, Jeffrey, you have 10 minutes. Yes, good evening. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Breen. I live at 4305 King Street, directly neighbors to Redstone Winery. For the past four or five years, we've been coming in with a noise complaint regarding their music. As of now, five families are moving, have moved or plan to move with, by the end of June. Um, I'm just making this short. I did the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario, the Section Act pertaining to noise, is LLA Regulation 719, Section 46. The holder of a license that applies to outdoor premises shall not permit noise that arises directly or indirectly from entertainment on that premises or from the sale or service of liquor to disturb the persons who reside the near uh, near the premises and another point is the Ministry of Agriculture has the uh, said that music is not a normal agricultural practice both bylaw and police have been had complaints and no results of satisfactory was uh, required they did in Redstone's favor they tried to implement some things and some of them work, but when something happens or the band's too big or it's too hot, they just scrap those plans and put them aside. So the noise gets louder and louder and louder as the evening goes. They've already, uh, the outcome of this meeting, I don't think that they particularly care what the outcome is because they've already scheduled and are advertising their tickets for sale for all the events they have this year. Pretty much that's it. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from committee? Seeing them, thank you, sir. Yep. At this point, I'd like to call upon David Sider of Redstone Winery for the delegation respecting report PL 18-20. Good evening, David. Evening, how are you? Please, very good, thank you. Please uh, go ahead, you have 10 minutes. Right. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, I'd first like to thank you uh, for affording me the opportunity to speak this evening in support of our application uh, for exemption from the town's noise bylaw uh, for a number of events during our 2018 summer season. I'd like to take a few moments uh, just to discuss the difference between uh, our different types of events uh, the benefits that we believe these events have for the community, uh, as well as measures that we've taken thus far uh, to alleviate any impact on the limited number uh, of residential dwellings in the vicinity of our property. Uh, the largest of our events is our summer concert series. Uh, as you have outlined in the staff report, uh, in 2018, we've applied for six permits on Thursday and Friday evenings. Uh, these events are for up to 149 guests and are some of our most popular events during the summer months. Uh, we promote our summer concert series as concerts that include dinner, uh, and as such, our guests do expect that the music will be at a volume that can be heard uh, over a conversation uh, throughout our patio. The acts that we have for these evenings are typically full bands uh, and include both amplified instruments and drums. Uh, our summer concert series has gained popularity uh, to the point that we have found uh, our revenue increases 400% on a Thursday night concert uh, versus a Thursday without. As you can imagine, this type of an increase uh, makes these events crucial to the viability of our business. Uh, as many of our guests uh, for these events are drawn from out of town, we feel that the economic value to the area is significant through additional winery and or restaurant visits, overnight accommodation, fuel purchases and the like. In addition to the benefit for our neighboring businesses, uh, there's also a definite benefit to our approximately 50 staff, many of whom are Lincoln residents, as the increased business that these events afford us on an otherwise quiet evening uh, obviously equates to more hours and subsequently greater pay for our team. Uh, the second of our events uh, is our friends and neighbors nights. Uh, these events are hosted year-round, uh, but only include music uh, on Tuesday nights during the summer and are extremely popular with our local guests. Over the course of these nights, we'll welcome approximately 170 guests uh, and treat them to live background music on our patio. Uh, the acts that we bring in for Friends and Neighbors Nights uh, are between one and three pieces uh, and do include amplified instrument. Uh, the volume of these acts easily allows for private conversations to occur throughout the restaurant. Um, Additionally, it's worth noting that we've seen such demand for our friends and neighbors nights 
uh, that we've expanded them to include all non-concert Thursday evenings during the summer months as well. Uh, however, we do not intend uh, to offer any live music on those evenings. Additionally, uh, in hopes to alleviate some of the concerns from our neighbours regarding audible noise, uh, after background noise such as traffic on King Street has slowed, uh, we intend to conclude the music on these evenings at 9pm rather than 10pm as was the case last year. Uh, also, as these events do occur weekly uh, and the music is intended to be background noise, uh, we agreed with our neighbours last year that the speakers would be placed on the ground uh, and thereby be blocked by both our cedars uh, as well as our acoustic curtain that surrounds our stage. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, this was an extremely successful remedy uh, as I received very limited comments from our neighbours regarding the volume of our musicians on those nights. Uh, finally, the last events for which we've applied for uh, exemptions is for a handful of weddings that we'll be hosting at the restaurant this year. Uh, we've applied for short periods in the afternoon uh, as the Town of Lincoln does have a 24 hour uh, prohibition on the use of any amplification device. Uh, as such, we've applied for brief exemptions in the afternoon uh, in the event that our wedding couple or their officiant wish to use a microphone during their ceremony. Uh, for one single wedding, we have applied for an exemption until 11 p.m. as they've hired a band uh, and would like for them to play outdoors. Weddings are a new venture for us and a market for which we see significant potential. And we hope that the town will support us in exploring the possibilities surrounding this market and allowing us to capitalize on the significant for demand for these types of events that we have seen. Uh, as in the case of our concert series, we see weddings as a win ju not just for us, but for business in the town as a whole, as there are many additional services that will be required by wedding guests over the course of their visit that we will not be providing. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to consider our applications. Uh, we firmly believe that these events are a win not only for us, but for the businesses and residents of the area. Many of our return guests are Town of Lincoln residents, uh, who love what we've been able to offer in terms of value-added events on our patio and have expressed a desire that more wineries do the same. The same feeling is shared by our out-of-town guests, and I have no doubt that there's a definite economic benefit from these events to our neighbouring businesses as well. It's our hope uh, that you'll recommend uh, to Council to approve these applications and support us in our attempt to make Lincoln an even more desirable place to visit. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Are there any questions or comments? Councilor McMillan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Last year when, when we dealt with this the same issue and uh, had an opportunity to come down to Redstone and, and, and talk to you about some of the issues that were um, being brought to our attention and you did have the, the acoustic drapes, did you, and you, you mentioned them tonight, that they're still there and you found them to be effective? Uh, they are. Um, we did find them to be effective, number one. Um, I was the direct contact for the neighbours to reach out to uh, on those evenings and for the Friends and Neighbours Night specifically. Um, I had had extremely limited uh, concern on those evenings. I believe there was one night and it was just a message to remind me to close the curtain. Um, additionally, I've made a point. Um, last year, the, the primary uh, complainant was a home on merit. Um, and I had driven down there and any time that there was uh, that we had live music playing just to hear for myself how, how the sound was. And we did. Well, I personally found that there was a definite a definite improvement when the curtain was closed. The other thing that was looked at at that time was uh, landscaping, and I believe you put in the, um, a cedar hedge. Uh, that, that hedge is still there, and it's, it's growing. Again, did you find that to be effective? Uh, we certainly found the combination of the two. The hedge was certainly more effective uh, on the Tuesday nights when the speakers are on the ground, uh, as the cedars are not full-grown yet. And, and the final one, and there, there's a comment in the report that's coming to committee later on this evening that says that there is a, a commitment to consider further measures to address potential concerns. Have you given that any thought and can you can expand on that for us this evening? Over the course of last year, the concerns that we dealt with directly were extremely minimal. Um, you know, we, we, had, uh, we had bylaw officers out not due to complaints, uh, but more so due to investigation on the town's behalf uh, for virtually every event. Uh, at no point uh, were we asked to, to turn the music down. At no point were we, were we told that there was, um, you know, a, a disturbance that, that in the opinion of the bylaw officer needed to be remedied. Um, so, you know, at, at this stage in the game, I think we're very happy with where we are. Um, you know, we're, we're welcome to, to feedback following this season, um, both from, you know, both from our neighbours as, well as as well as the town. But then there is um, this. There are no plans for any additional um, additions at the, at the site in order to mitigate, mitigate the sound. At this time, no. 
um, you know, if and if and when uh, between um, feedback from our neighbors as well as uh, feedback from the bylaw department, it's determined that the noise is at a level such that further abatement is required. That's certainly something that we're willing to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chris, the, um, the issue of the bylaw officer coming mm. out, I just want to understand that a little bit better. Should council understand that the bylaw officers were coming to every event to monitor compliance with the bylaw? Is that, is that what we should understand? That's correct. Okay, and you're not aware that there were any issues there? Well, I, I guess the question is, were there any issues? Did they write any tickets? No, I, was, I was on site for, for every one of our events at no point. Um, at no point was I provided with any with any feedback from a bylaw officer along the lines of, of you know, ter the volume being excessive or, or anything like that. Okay, so um, what about issues? Um, were there subsequent complaints that would have been related to the latter part of the evening? So I have, I have in being the, the primary contact for the, for the neighbors throughout the event, I, I certainly received a handful of text messages for a few events. Um, one of them being, as I said, a, a reminder on a Tuesday night for us to close the curtain, which we promptly did. Um, there were, uh, I'd say the recurring theme was, as you said, at the, at the latter part of the evening. Um, the issue being that, that the noise was getting louder. Um, I can say without question that the, the volume uh, of the band certainly hadn't changed. Um, so our assumption was that, you know, traffic on King Street had died down. Um, Towards the towards the later parts of the evening, and and the noise was then perceived as louder by our neighbors, um, and as a result, uh, this uh, this year on the Tuesday evenings, we we intend to to stop the music an hour earlier to hopefully remedy that a little bit. Okay, so just uh, to carry on with Councillor McMillan's question, then um, you are planning to mitigate further by pulling back that extra hour, knowing that you can't control the volume of noise on the highway on the friends and neighbors can't rely yes. on it <laughs> Correct, yes. right okay thank you very much thanks mr. chairman thank you Councilor Timbers I uh, thank you chair Thompson through you to the delegation uh, thanks for coming out tonight David um, I just wanted to um, look at the conditions I'm sure you're very aware of the attached conditions you know that and so you are the contact for the people yourself Correct. yes and um, you're sending out notices to the entire properties that are okay um, I did notice that the friends and neighbors you're doing actually less events than last year is that correct correct and you are going to be cutting it off at 9 p.m. which correct. is yes. earlier than last year mm -hmm. so I think um, as far as the sound you know the wind can affect the sound as well you know if the wind whatever direction it's going so you said that you are willing to take further steps if necessary if the sound is an issue we are the wind specifically is a rather I know you can't is a, control is a rather the wind. well it's it's also um, rather tricky in that we are surrounded by a vineyard and airflow is an extremely extremely right. important part of viticulture um, so that is that's certainly the most complicated uh, of the issues and and the most complicated factor to, to control um, and remedy as you said course and as well as the traffic yes. I understand that um, so you were saying that you only had a few a few text messages Correct. and you had no bylaw infractions nothing was written up okay all right thank you very much thank you is there anyone else on committee and questions or comments thank you David thank you I have a motion moved by Councillor Timmers seconded by Councillor Foster that the delegations be presented be received Questions on the motion? Your pleasure on the motion? Motion is carried. So we'll now go into our, uh, seeing as we have no correspondence this evening, we'll go into our report section. The first report being PL 18-19, report providing an update on the Prudhomme Secondary Plan. And I'd like to start off with uh, CAO Kirkopoulos. 
Please go ahead, Mr. CAO. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to take a, a moment to provide some opening comments uh, while uh, Associate Director Bruder, Bruder uh, readies himself for the presentation. Uh, I think as, as council and the community will know, uh, we've been uh, working at this for the better part of the last two years. Uh, we have uh, been in front of uh, council uh, a few dozen times um, over the last two years. Uh, and this really tonight is a, is a culmination of that. Uh, it's a culmination of two years of work, uh, significant engagement with the community. Uh, and I did want to thank uh, Mr. Gillespie and all the residents of Victoria Shores uh, for the level of uh, engagement over the last two years. I see a lot of familiar faces that I've come to know here. Ron smiling up there in, in the back row, uh, Fraser, uh, a number of other individuals. I don't want to exclude anyone, so I'll try not to name everyone. Uh, some of the other individuals here that are waving to me. So, uh, you know, this is more than just a planning uh, exercise, and I think uh, that's something that I do want to uh, acknowledge. Uh, as much as this is about planning, it's also about economic development. Uh, it's everything from uh, the commercial opportunities that we're going to see in this location uh, to, to shopping local. Uh, it's about employment lands that we're also going to see there, and I think Mr. Bruder will touch on that uh, as he takes you through a presentation. It's about a distinct tourism offering, and I know we've had questions around what will make this uh, location distinct and, and what do we hope to achieve there. Uh, we've also heard comments about Vineland, and I think in a lot of ways uh, this helps Vineland. It helps make that connection. It doesn't take away from it. So a sincere thanks, I think, first and foremost to the residents who have remained as engaged, and I think we've realized through this process that when there isn't that level of engagement, uh, how things can go wrong, but when there is a level of engagement and, uh, and a willingness to seek a solution, uh, that things can uh, work out for the better. So there's a couple of other people I do want to acknowledge uh, who are here from the region, uh, three individuals that have been instrumental as well in terms of working with our staff, and that is uh, Commissioner Reno uh, Mustachi that's here, uh, Kirsten McCauley who's also here and worked diligently uh, with our staff uh, to, to go through this particular item, and Donna uh, Wasishan from Community Services uh, at the region that's also here, and I don't see Donna, but uh, she's, she's somewhere there, there she is, uh, who's also here uh, in attendance this evening. So uh, I will turn it over, uh, I will turn it over to Matt to kind of take you through the presentation. As I did say to, uh, to Ted, uh, one of the things he will see in this presentation is uh, we have uh, addressed wording. You'll see that we've underlined a word uh, when we talk about that road connection, which was important, uh, and, and that road, uh, we've actually made it stronger than what you suggested. Uh, in terms of prevent, we've actually said prohibit, and we underline that. So hopefully when you see that, uh, it addresses, uh, I think, some of your concerns. But I'll try not to take uh, any any excitement and steam away uh, from Mr. Brood, and I'll let him take you through the presentation. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Mr. Bruder, would you like to go ahead with your presentation, please? And uh, committee members, you can switch to the inputs on your uh, computers. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, um, I wanted to take you through a short presentation today, everybody, just to um, highlight a couple of things. First and foremost, I want to provide a little bit of context with respect to how secondary plans fit into the whole uh, planning and development process. And I also wanted to provide um, and kind of extract out some of the key uh, issues that have been identified along the way um, through our consultation efforts as a result of the last uh, public meetings held in January and provide a little bit of an update um, with respect to them. So um, first and foremost, the secondary plan and where it fits in. So what I've done here is I've, you know, just created a very rudimentary um, chart here showing uh, where it slots in with, you know, from uh, the official plan as a long range um, guiding document and then all the way down to building permits. So basically the, the official plan is the overarching uh, guideline document for the town. Um, where secondary plan fits in is where uh, you want to look at, you know, a specific area of development interest more specifically um, and look at uh, things pertaining to land use, public spaces, building heights, things of the like. Um, it's still a very high level document. Um, it's meant to guide um, the next stage, which is receiving the town receiving development applications, but at the same time to provide some flexibility um, because when we get to the development application stage, um, a little bit more detailed design goes into that component and um, 
there's often the need to, you know, make slight revisions and adjustments um, as required. So that's the, the development application stage. There, there's um, typically a, a public component to many of the development applications that the town would receive. Um, and this would go hand in hand. We've, uh, we've been very diligent um, as a town in um, maintaining a high level of outreach and consultation um, as this uh, secondary plan process has been ongoing for the past two and a half years. So um, this is something you know that we want to continue. Um, once we get through the development application stage, then we get into the building permits and construction. And that's really the final stages to make sure that we hold uh, the plans to uh, what, they, what they include. We hold them to building code requirements. We hold them to um, high quality urban design standards that are within our, our overarching uh, planning guiding, guidance documents. So I hope that provides a little bit of clarity as for the whole process. So overall goals of the plan, um, I won't rehash, we, we did cover some of this back in the public meeting stage, but I think what this demonstrates is a, a commitment and a, and a vision to create an area that um, really forms a complete community. So it, it provides social well-being by um, having amenity spaces, pedestrian opportunities for its residents, making everything accessible, providing a range of housing opportunities, a range of employment, uh, commercial and retail opportunities, and really uh, creating that sense of place that also contributes to um, more of a, uh, a destination area as well that Lincoln's striving to be. So moving on for uh, some of the key issues that I've drawn out. Um, we heard a lot, we heard about a lot of these at length during the, uh, the previous public meetings. Um, so I wanted to provide a little bit of um, additional information now since we've had a little bit of time to work on uh, some of these issues. So we've already discussed the, um, the road connection between the Prudence Development, Victoria Shores road connection. Um, as our CAO just identified, we are, you know, looking to uh, indicate that yes, indeed, we are prohibiting for now uh, vehicular travel through that connection. At the same time, we want to maintain a level of connectivity, um, good planning practice, uh, calls for connectivity rather than isolation of adjacent communities. And uh, so this, we feel as a compromise, you know, we've included wording in the secondary plan um, to provide for, um, methods uh, to, uh, to prohibit the through traffic, but while at the same time we, we will be allowing for pedestrian travel through there and emergency service provision uh, as required. Um, we spoke at the public meetings about the potential for interchange improvements. Um, we, we'd been attempting to uh, address MTO and engage them in dialogue uh, for quite a while during this process. Since then, uh, our staff have been extremely diligent. We've been able to do so. We've met with them on a couple occasions. Uh, we met with their techno technical services staff. and. Um, what they did was they, they, they had a look at the secondary plan and they indicated their support for it. Uh, they looked at the high end projection for population numbers um, and what they were able to confirm is that while, you know, there are some improvements in the interchange areas uh, and to their, uh, their infrastructure that, that are likely required, um, they did confirm that the, uh, the footprint of the interchanges in their facility would, would not be, uh, there'd be no increase. So. Um, they did kind of provide a very general and high level, um, I guess, idea of what some of the required improvements might be. But as I mentioned before, really, you know, getting into the, the next stage after the secondary plan and the development application submissions, um, that's when, you know, they'll reserve their, uh, their opportunity to really look at some of these kind of more detailed designs, some of these traffic assess assessments that are gonna be required and more carefully hone and identify what their, uh, what their improvements are gonna be. Um, land use and height transition. Um, we've heard it today that uh, you know that's that's an important issue. I mean, generally, as has been stated, generally the the idea is to transition into a higher, uh, a higher and more compact built form in the middle of the Prudhomme site. Um, the interface with the existing Victoria Shores community uh, has has got it will have a, a very significant separation. Not only will there be that uh, that 12 meter wide uh, naturalized corridor in between, the, but there also will be rear yard setbacks required um, and, and setbacks for both the the dwellings and for the employment area. 
Um, there's the existing yards of the of the property owners there. So all in all, and, and I might add too that the 12 meter wide naturalized corridor is also gonna be uh, well vegetated too, which should provide an appropriate transition uh, so as to not make it too, um, too dramatic. Um, the exception, of course, is uh, the Vineland Manufacturing Site, which has been identified as well. Um, this one, uh, we responded to a request by the landowner uh, to accommodate a higher mixed-use type development. Um, it was considered by staff, and at the end of the day, given its, given its location and the, uh, you know, the, the potential to um, the potential to guide the development so as to step away the highest portion as far away from the existing residences as possible. We thought this was a, uh, a fit because of the, A, the provincial policy framework that we're in uh, that requires a, requires a more compact bill form, requires uh, us to, again, provide, you know, a very diverse range of housing opportunities. Um, but while at the same time, uh, there will be opportunities as we go on to development application stage to look at um, ways to mitigate any potential impacts that may be. Um, we, we would look at shadow and shading studies. We would look at uh, the potential for more plantings as part of the, uh, a future landscape plan maybe to, to better screen the property. Um, so, so there are, and even you know, the, the placement of windows, the orientation of the building to try to, to, try to minimize impacts to viewscapes. So there, 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 there's opportunities to further mitigate potential impacts there. Um, servicing improvements. Um, so uh, there, there were some servicing improvements required. Obviously, they've been they've been touched upon uh, that were identified as part of the, the regional master servicing plan. Um, what the town has done since the public meetings too is uh, we, we've had a third party review completed based on the upper population projection of the latest secondary plan, just as a matter of due diligence to make sure that uh, that's properly being considered. Um, as a result, um, you'll see on this slide here that there, there are some um, upsizing requirements uh, a little bit higher than what were previously identified. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, the, lower, the pumping station will still be able to be accommodated within its ex existing property. There'll be no additional property um, requirements. Um, it's also important to, uh, to note that uh, typically, uh, from what I understand with the region, that uh, when, when you're looking at servicing upgrades, um, a new station versus an existing station, I mean, the, the, as long as the existing station can be upsized appropriately, can properly service development, can properly convey flows, um, it, it's viewed as more favorably rather than building a new station just simply because, you know, um, that, that's an extra station to, for capital costs, it's an extra station to maintain and to upkeep in perpetuity. So um, there is also, you know, additional design that's going to be required. Uh, the region will be initiating design, I believe, this year for the pumping station upgrade. It will take into account um, uh, information that will be obtained, such as um, Mr. Gillespie referred to some of the floodplain mapping and such. So that, that design will still, there's opportunities to consider design refinements to address any issues that are identified as in the, at that time as well. Um, trees and natural environment. This was, this was identified, we, we, we heard concerns with respect to, uh, you know, what types of species are going to be planted, um, connectivity of ecosystem uh, components within the plan area, um, potential loss of, tr of trees and canopy coverage, and um, there, there, there is wording within the secondary plan policies. Um, we want to maintain preservation of natural areas and woodlots. We want to make sure that they're connected and we, and we do recognize their importance to the overall ecological function of the area. Um, we will work with developers. Um, if there are tree removals that are unavoidable, um, we will work towards a tree replacement ratio uh, to make sure that we maintain um, a, a forest, mature forest canopy in the area. Um, we definitely indicate in the secondary plan that native species are preferred, but we do recognize there might be instances where non-native species uh, may be more appropriate. If that's the case, um, it's just going to have to be, you know, we're, we're going to have to ensure that the uh, that they integrate and uh, and support the adjacent natural environment features without being, and they're non-invasive. 
Um, the eastern part of the site is designated as special policy area um, in the Greenbelt plan. However, it's already been um, developed for non-agricultural uses. Um, it's, it's not uh, appropriate to even consider trying to convert it back to agricultural production. It's not feasible. Um, and even on top of that, the, the growth plan identifies it as an undele undelineated built up area, um, recognizing its development potential. So there's even conflict among, you know, the conflicting provincial policies. In that sense, the town and the region also recognize these lands um, as developed, supportive of uh, the redevelopment of these lands for continued non-agricultural uses. So on that front, there, there is uh, additional, current and additional dialogue that's gonna be undertaken with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. So just to quickly outline next steps now. Um, tonight we have, uh, there's a recommendation report before you. Um, if you, if it is approved, the prudent secondary plan, then there'll be a notice of approval. Uh, and then uh, subsequently, the, the plan will require approval by Niagara Regional Council. And if that occurs, it'll be followed by a 20 day appeal period. And then following the appeal period, as provided there are no appeals received, then uh, development applications can be submitted by the landowners taking us into the next kind of stage in the planning and development process. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. That was a very comprehensive overview and I really appreciate all the work that you and the rest of the folks in planning have done to make this, uh, put this together. Are there any questions uh, from committee members this evening? Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think Matt did a very nice job of um, answering many of the questions uh, that were brought up tonight. Um, I think, I think the one question I've still got is, uh, have we have we done any shading studies on that uh, Victoria manufacturing site? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, not presently. Typically, those types of studies are done when we have uh, an actual conceptual site plan or something to consider with respect to how and where the building's gonna be oriented. We're not there yet. We're still at kind of the higher level secondary plan process. I mean, uh, I just typically we wait until we have a little more information from the developer. It's usually a component of obtaining approval for a development application, so that's when we would be requesting that. Through you, Mr. Chair, but would you not agree that that once you set it in the secondary plan, uh, it's there. It's 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 uh, acceptable to put up a eight or a ten story building. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Well, it, it, it is acceptable so long as, you know, there's uh, proper measures put in place. Uh, you know, for instance, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but basically at the end of the day, just because it says it does provide the provision for 10 stories in the secondary plan, there still might be, you know, reasons why it doesn't go to 10 stories. I mean, that the, the secondary plan does provide that flexibility to go that high, but you know, if there was a significant impact that could not be mitigated associated with, with going to 10 stories, there would be an opportunity there to consider a compromise as well. Thank you, Matt. Actually, I'm gonna go to Kathleen for further comments on your question. Councilor McPherson. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Within the town's official plan, there's also policies that are called complete application policies. And as part of the pre-consultation process, um, there are various studies that various agencies, town departments can request that is required to be a complete application. Um, so shadowing studies would be one of those, those studies that would be required for a development such as this. Is that are your questions, Council? Well, I, I think, <laughs> And thank you for those answers. And I, and I guess I'm, I'm just um, unsure as to the approval tonight and, and what does that do, even with, with um, shadow studies down the road, uh, how does, how does our, our secondary plan stand up if we say no to uh, a, a eight-story building or a four st you know, or a 10-story building? If we're approving that tonight, I think it's, 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 it's part of our plan. Ms. Dale, did you want to comment to that? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, yes, it is part of the, it will be part of the secondary plan, but the secondary plan 
also gets incorporated into the official plan. So not only do we look at the secondary plan policies, but staff also have to look at the other policies in the official plan, including the complete application policies. So there, there's um, always the opportunity to require detailed studies as part of a planning application. So Mr. Chair, if I may, so if, if we did do a, a shading study down the road and we, we found that it was negatively impacting, we have uh, a leg to stand on and are not going to be ending up at a tribunal um, discussion as a result of our secondary plan. Ms. Dale? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, the pr whole purpose of the shadowing study is for, you know, tall buildings. Um, and this is something that was, um, um, can be looked at at the development stage. So if, you know, if for whatever reason they do the shadowing study and they show that there is an impact, um, one of the things that staff would ask them to do is to lower the height of the building so it's not impact. The, the one thing to keep in mind is an applicant always has the opportunity to appeal any decision of council. So there, you can't guarantee that it won't be appealed. But at least there would be a planning basis with the staff recommendation that because of the shadowing study, staff are recommending in this case, this portion of the building is only seven stories and this portion can be 10. Is that helpful, Thank Councilor? You. Councilor Foster? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is the second uh, uh, time that I've seen a secondary plan come forward on this Prudhams property. Um, the first uh, one that came through a number of years ago, um, I liked that secondary plan when it came through. Um, and it set the tone that the municipality and the region want to have access to and control of the waterfront. I think that was critical from that original. But this secondary plan is better. Like I, I really like what it is that we're seeing here. Um, this has been an extremely public pro process right throughout. Um, the issues that have come forward um, have been dealt with um, for the most part. There's obviously some, some, still some sore points or some questions that are going on with things. But one of the nice things about a secondary plan is that this truly is the guideline for what it is that we want to do into the future with, with, uh, with this particular area. Um, and uh, experience shows that the developer or developers that are going to go forward with this may come back with some changes that they want to make or the municipality may decide, no, there's some changes that have to be made. I mean, once things start going and moving along. So I guess through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to, to, uh, to uh, our, our presenter here, um, can, can he just explain a little bit what happens with that? Like, in other words, what would we be looking at um, with changes that might be expected coming down the road? What type of a process goes into play with it? And, and further, the site plan process and exactly how that's all gonna lay out for everyone as we go through it, because I think that's the most critical part of this. Through you, Mr. Chair. So, I mean, I think it would depend on what, what the changes are that are being requested. Um, you know, this, this comes with a, a pretty, you know, it's got a, it's got a height strategy, a land use schedule. Um, you know, if there were changes, there would, you know, if there were amendments required to the plan, it would be a public process as well. Um, we'd have to come back for a decision. Um, it, it's, uh, it would have to be made as well before a site plan even gets submitted. Um, you know, if there's any changes to the secondary plan that are significant like that, that, you know, that require an actual plan amendment, um, they would have to get council approval and then, you know, we would move forward into the site plan process after that. And the site plan process, you know, as you know, um, the staff goes back and forth with the, with the developer. There's often things that are addressed um, at that time, you know, we look at urban design guidelines when we look at site plans and we look at ways to optimize what the development's gonna be, uh, make it better conform to the plan, use the plan to really draw out the best 
in uh, in what the property could be. So, um, you know, that that's kind of what the overview of the process would be. There is some, you know, minor changes that can be made at the site plan stage as well. Thank you, and so that that's the critical part, and thank you for pointing that out. It's that there is significant public process that could come into play as we're moving down the road, but be that as it may, this is a absolutely solid front end um, as we as we start moving into this process. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Bruder, for your presentation. Mr. Chairman, I would like to compliment um, all of the people that have been involved. I think we must have an unprecedented um, 120 citizens that have been consistently involved with this. I, I really think it's quite remarkable. And I think I spoke to Mr. Gillespie and others at one point and encouraged them to continue with their due diligence and do the checks against the checks because things do change and information does surface while you're going through a process like this. And therefore, you have to be able to go back and make sure that your original assumptions are going to be carried out into the future. So I think um, your tenacity to hang on to your own principles around the development has been extremely important. Mr. Chairman, uh, in um, through you to the presenter, Mr. Bruder, there was a picture uh, that showed the waterfront area, <clears throat> and I had never seen a wooden boardwalk, and I want to make sure that that isn't um, a rendering um, and not a reality, because I, I have not, I have never ever seen that 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 walkway along the waterfront. Could you clarify that um, one way or the other, just so that there aren't any misperceptions? Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the actual wooden boardwalk that you're speaking of, it was, um, you know, at this stage when we talk about secondary plans, it was more of a concept. Um, it's not necessarily how the promenade area, how the walkway would, would end up. At least I don't believe that was the intention. It was to show how it, in, it could indeed look. Um, typically, again, you know, that's, that's something that we would figure out when we get into a little more detailed design. There might be some other factors that play into providing such a, a boardwalk. So um, at this point, it was more just to provide a, a, a concept. Okay, so would you agree that the, um, the entire um, process of establishing waterfront um, protection and waterfront access that Councillor Foster referred to um, is absolutely intact. However, the design of it in the future, depending on the topography, um, the adjacency to the lake and the attitude of our lake <laughs> all have to be taken into account. Uh, yes, that's fair to say for sure. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, through you, I, I want to um, make sure that there is complete transparency around this road. <clears throat> so the word prohibit, fine. If you're happy with it, I'm happy with it. But I just want to make sure that the community understands this council is, leans favorably to high level planning principles which connect communities. I can think of at least 10 projects that we have on the go right now where this prevails. So I can understand why this needs to be prohibited during the construction phase, which may be 10 years, it may be 12 years, we don't really know at this time. So for the next, so I'm just going to put words in your mouth and you're gonna tell me whether I'm right or wrong because I want everybody to hear this. So this prohibition is in place based on good plan, planning, planning principles for the duration of the construction, which may be 10 or 12 years. In the meantime, there will be emergency access and there will be other accesses required but at the same time, people will cycle and people will walk at will, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. I mean, I don't know necessarily if it's a strictly uh, limited, like prohibiting traffic, like during the construction. I mean, I think it's something that, you know, there is flexibility there. If we do need to evaluate a different type of situation later on, 
to enhance connectivity further, we can do that. So I think um, as a town, we have that flexibility later on, but uh, you know, um, I think it would be you know, based on further assessment of conditions at that time, but at, for at the very least, I would say yes during construction. Okay, so the, the citizens that live in this area can be reassured that during, at the very least, during the um, construction phase that they will not be inconvenienced unduly by what's, by any additional traffic. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'm bringing this up because we have a circumstances in the town right now where there are, where there is a barrier at the end of the street and, um, and so it was put there, it's my understanding, to ensure that during the construction phase that people in the adjacent neighborhoods would not be inconvenienced. And it is my understanding that it was never meant to be permanent. And so at some point in time when the construction is done in this large development, then they will, that access will open up. And I'm sure that, that it will have concern. But this is a basic and very important principle for this community. If we believe that interconnectedness is important for the building of communities, that the inconvenience aside, which we are accommodating the community to the full extent that we possibly can, that there may be, that there probably will be in 10 or 12 years, a reason to open that up. And I just wanna make sure that we are in agreement with this and that we're going to go forward with this because otherwise, you know, I don't want um, any of us to be called less than truthful at the end of all of this. So Mr. Chairman, I don't know why, how you wanna handle it, but I think that we need to deal with that. I think it's important. Councillor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and my understanding um, of our discussions around this particular entrance was a emergency uh, only the road would be built and we would, we would put up bollards, whatever it is, uh, and access uh, for emergencies beyond the construction phase. That this was a, this was a planned um, blocked road, if you will, for uh, vehicles, for general vehicle use. Uh, it would be access for bicycles, it would be access for, for uh, walking, obviously and that we would put some kind of obstruction in that roadway to uh, prevent vehicles from traveling through beyond the construction. That was, that's my understanding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kropoulos, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the opportunity uh, to, to hopefully provide a little bit of clarity. So I've been involved in a number of these conversations uh, with our planning staff and I think the way I would characterize it is we didn't put actually a, a, a time horizon on this particular uh, issue. Uh, we agree that the community, and I've heard the community loud and clear uh, regarding that prohibition. Uh, we did want to put uh, what we're going to call barriers in place that allow uh, pedestrian traffic to occur but limit vehicular traffic unless it's emergency only. Uh, the reason we didn't put a time horizon on that and the reason you know we're trying to address it this way is you know, in five years, the community may come back to us and say, you know what, we actually want to remove those bollards and actually have access. Or they may not, they may come to us in 15 years or 20 years from now and say, you know, we believe uh, that it's time to do that. And there may be different decision making uh, at the table or around the table. And so, you know, I never want to limit it to a time horizon or put a time horizon on that. It can be as short and as long as the community wants. And our goal was always to work with the community and, to, uh, and try to address their issues. And at the same time, from a planning perspective, uh, you know, do what was right, maintain that connectivity. I think to, to the mayor's point and what she highlights in other parts of the community, we put what I'm gonna call, um, artificial and concrete barriers that are a lot more difficult to remove and a lot more costly. And I think when you start doing that uh, and putting in those types of barriers versus the barriers we're talking about, which still allow for uh, pedestrian access and allow for the type of access we want, then going back becomes far more difficult. In this particular case, we are not recommending those types of barriers, but rather the ones that allow uh, 
entry and exit uh, as we deem appropriate and as we work with the community to deem appropriate. So uh, I'm hoping that provides clarity to the community that's listening in terms of, uh, and to the residents that are here as well as to members of, of committee and, and council in terms of what our desired objective is. Uh, protecting, I think, good planning principles, but at the same time listening to the community and knowing these things evolve uh, over the appropriate time horizon. Thank you, Mr. Ciego. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I really, um, I'm satisfied with the answer. I think that's the answer that the community want to hear. I hope you're shaking your heads. Thank you very much, Ted. That's what I was looking for because this, um, I don't want there to be any confusion about what the intention is here. And it seems that sometimes after meetings, there's a little bit of, you know, maybe not the level of assurity that you think you're, you're working with. Um, and this is going to be, this is a pretty important decision for everybody to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kirkopoulos. Thank you. Any other comments from committee? Seeing none. I have a motion before me, moved by Councillor Foster and seconded by Councillor Timmers, that for reasons outlined in PL 18-19, it's hereby recommended that one, the official plan amendment Consisting of the updated Prudhomme Secondary Plan, PLOPA 20160108, be approved and presented to Council. And two, that the approval of the official plan amendment be accompanied by approval of contract planning slash development engineering and community engagement resources, <coughs> excuse me, to address the subsequent increase in incoming development applications. The contract duration is anticipated to be three to five years. Any questions to that motion? Your pleasure on that motion? That motion is carried. Yes, Councillor, go ahead. Just a word of explanation. If, if anybody in the audience is wondering why I'm not voting, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I am, I am not a member of this committee, and I don't have a vote. But I have. A, I have a say, but I don't have a vote. My vote comes to council. Thank you for clarifying that. My uh, apologize for omitting. Uh, that portion. So the next uh, next report on our agenda this evening is PL 18-20. Just gonna wait a moment while Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna continue our meeting here. Councillors? Councillor McMillan, thank you. So we're going into report PL 18-20, the noise exemption by Redstone Winery. I have a motion 
Moved by Councillor Timmers, seconded by Councillor Foster, that for reasons outlined in PL 18-20, it's hereby recommended um, that the noise bylaw exemption application 2018-01 by Redstone Winery, as outlined in this report, be approved subject to the following conditions. A, Redstone Winery complies with the town noise bylaw and the exemption granted for the event dates and times outlined in this report. B, the event organizer shall notify all neighboring property owners within 500 meters of the entire property boundary in writing a minimum of 10 days in advance of the start date of the event. A copy of the written notice shall be provided to the town for approval prior to being distributed. <coughs> Excuse me. C, that the above notification shall be provide the neighboring property owners with a direct telephone number to call during the event should the neighbors experience any noise concerns. D, that the event organizer shall respond to and take appropriate corrective action to any noise complaints to minimize any disturbances from the event. And E, if the town is required to respond to any legitimate noise complaints, the event organizer will be responsible for payment of the town's noise complaint inspection fee. Are there any questions or concerns to the report or the motion? Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. And, um, you know, I, I, I understand that this is a very, one of those very delicate situations. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not any um, easy, easy resolution. Not everybody wins. But, you know, I, I do, um, I do like, what I'm hearing from Redstone in uh, what they've done uh, thus far uh, last year to uh, work with the local residents uh, to mitigate uh, noise. I, I like what I'm hearing again this year that uh, they're gonna take the music back an hour uh, and they're gonna continue to be open to uh, further mitigation uh, of uh, potential noises. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's a balance out in the rural community uh, that is difficult to get a perfect situation. But I, I really think that uh, we've got to be supportive. I, I certainly will support this, this report uh, in uh, our local businesses, uh, bringing in um, customers, visitors, uh, and also working within what uh, we um, have put out generally as the, as the noise uh, bylaw and is also continuing to open or to show an openness to uh, mitigation. So I will support this. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, actually Mayor Easton and then Councillor McMillan. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, the intent to monitor was always in the plan uh, for this um, um, operation as well as any others in the community. So I'm very pleased to hear that. That is exactly what happened last year. And I just have a question of uh, Mr. Bruder uh, to determine whether or not that level of compliance monitoring could extend to the um, later part of the um, uh, of the event in order to make sure that some of the, those concerns that were brought up by the um, delegation uh, would be addressed. Certainly, Madam, uh, go ahead, Mr. Berger. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's certainly our intent to make sure that that, that happens. So, okay, yeah. that's fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you on that basis. I can support the uh, request. Thank you. Councilor McMillan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, agree with what um, Councillor McPherson just said that this is not an easy decision. However, I think that the um, the, the five conditions that have that are imposed upon um, Redstone in that are um, identified in the motion will go um, a long way in hoping to mitigate any of the situations that could arise um, during the um, during the summer festival season. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Foster. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, first of all, I, I got to say I think Redstone is, has moved in the right direction with, with how they're dealing with this and how they're mitigating as it's going on. I might give them full credit for it, and, and it's pretty obvious in the discussion points that it really truly is in their interest to make this work. I mean, financially, it seems like it, you know, they, they have to make this work or as an organization, so it's in their interest to, to make it work all the way around. So, so I'm, I'm confident that all of this is, is going to hopefully work out well for everyone as we move down the road. I am going to be curious and, and, and I hope we have the discussions in the not too distant future with Redstone because there was a much more comprehensive plan had been put in place when we originally uh, did the site plan and, and did everything with Redstone. Um, so I'll be curious where they want to go because I think, um, um, you know, there's a number of things like that that um, I think would be quite interesting um, um, to know where they really want to land with all of this in the long run. So, but anyway, for this one, I'm good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Councillor. Certainly, uh, <clears throat> I'm pleased to see that the business is cooperating and trying to make uh, the neighbors happy as well as trying to make their businesses happy. So. Uh, any other comments or concerns or questions to the motion? Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Next report on the agenda this evening is report PL 18-21, uh, request to consider a minor variance application by Phelps Homes. I have a motion moved by Councillor McPherson and seconded by Mayor Easton that for reasons outlined in PL 18-21, it's hereby recommended that Council approve the re a request to consider a, to consider a minor variant submission by Phelps Homes Limited as an exception to Section 45, 1.3 of the Planning Act that prohibits requests for a minor variance before the second anniversary of the day on which the bylaw was amended. Are there any questions from committee to that report? or to this motion. Councillor Foster. Two, well, minor thing. One is um, the uh, report itself should be corrected because there's a, there's a mistake in that in the long term. It doesn't have another identifier in it. But, um, but secondly, um, can we just explain, normally minor variances do not come through this particular committee, so can we just have a quick explanation as to why um, it's coming forward with this one. Go ahead, uh, Director. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, some of the Planning Act rules, rules changed a couple years ago. So when somebody got approved zoning, they were prohibited for applying <coughs> for a minor variance to that approved zoning for, for a period of two years when they got the initial zoning approved. Um, so in order to submit a minor variance application, they have to have an approval by committee and council. So it's now an extra step. Very good. Mayor? Mr. Chairman, I just want to be absolutely certain what we're dealing with here. Um, I know that um, we don't, we're not dealing with the whole property, so we don't know exactly the way it's going to look. We're actually, um, just, we're actually just dealing with allowing them to go back to the amending process. Exactly. Yeah. So this is really the installation of a fencing system or a barrier system. Is that, is that how we should define this? That has a sign on it. Huh? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's that's correct, more or less. So uh, it's just with respect to a required retaining wall, right. um, decorative that's portions of, of a portion of the fence, and then there, the entry features as well. Into okay. The so this faces Regional Road 81, correct? Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to be absolutely clear because there isn't any other context really except that picture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions to the report or the, the uh, motion? Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Next uh, report on our agenda this evening is PL 18-22, subdivision agreement for Camden Estates. 
I have a motion moved by Mayor Easton and seconded by Councillor McPherson that for reasons outlined in PL 18-22, it's hereby recommended that one, that a bylaw be presented to Council for approval to authorize the execution of subdivision agreement for the Camden, Camden Estates subdivision with 2225966 Ontario Incorporated and that agreement be finalized subject to A, final approval of engineering plans by the development engineering staff and all applicable agencies and B, final approval of the engineering estimates by development engineering staff to reflect the final engineering plans. Are there any questions from committee to the report or to the motion? Councillor Timmers. Thank you, Chair Thompson. I just have a comment regarding this development. Um, I was really happy to see that this is finally coming forward. It's been about 20 years that I've been waiting to see this piece of property developed. Um, it's unfortunate that they, they will be putting in um, cisterns for water. It was my understanding that there was no development to happen on that side of um, fly road until there was water in Camden. So I'm just wondering if anyone could speak to that. That was part of the agreement about 20 years ago. I'm just wondering. Um, Mrs. Dale, would you like to speak to that? I believe there was a bylaw that was um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, prior to um, the one of the previous owners obtaining draft plan approval, um, that issue was addressed um, by a previous uh, council. So there were some changes made to the secondary plan that did allow for development to go ahead in what this area was referred to as the phase two area on cistern. So there was actually a study um, done by consultants to look at cisterns for the entire area because um, at that time it was indicated that there was very, very remote possibility that there would ever be water in this area. Does that okay. uh, answer your question, Kelly? It does. I just, um, I, am, I am pleased to see that, you know, the development is going to happen. So I was happy to see it. I just wanted to know where, where that uh, issue about water was. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm really predisposed to uh, not support this because after all of this time, I would have thought that at the very least, the developers would have come in this evening, that they would have brought with them some photographs or renderings about what this is going to look like. And really, you know, what are we approving here? A substantial development in a very important hamlet in our community and we don't even have, uh, they don't have enough regard to come and, and provide us with uh, a delegation or to explain it. I find it, it completely unacceptable and I don't understand why they would do this. This is a very important area of the town that has had some very nice development in it. What, what are we supposed to interpret from this drawing? It doesn't tell me anything. They could be putting up houses that have some sort of facade features on them or facade materials that are completely not consistent with what is going on with the, in the town at this time. So I will get over this in the next five minutes, but I am not impressed with this type of presentation to committee. Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you, Chair Thompson. I, I personally, I don't wanna see this motion lost. I think maybe what we're looking for is a deferral or to look for more information. I don't know if that would satisfy you, Mary Stone. Actually, what would satisfy me is for, through you, Mr. Chairman, is for the developers to have regard for the committee. And I've spoken to this before. I don't want this deferred either. But I certainly have no reassurance about what this place is, what this development is going to look like, none whatsoever. How could we possibly? So I will get over this, as I said, in the next five minutes. I just hope it never happens again. Mrs. Dale, did you want to comment to this? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, before these reports go forward, we do advise the applicants that a report is being presented to committee, so they do have the opportunity to come and request 
to appear as a delegation. For whatever reason, these applicants did not. Um, in the case of this development, it's a fairly old draft plan of subdivision, so it didn't have any specific conditions requiring an urban design brief, which is something that we're incorporating into all new developments. So it, it's 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 because this is a an older plan of subdivision, it didn't have that specific condition. Um, and what we are, usually we ask for that, that type of material when they're at a subdivision stage or a zoning stage. Um, we're now at the last stage of development where this is actually a subdivision agreement which will allow them to go in, service the lands, put in the roads, grade the lands, those types of things. So this is the end of the process. Oh, very nice, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, Ms. Dale. I understand the technicalities, but there has been no courtesy afforded to the committee at all, and we still don't know anything more than we did three minutes ago, and I don't expect the staff to pull rabbits out of a hat, but maybe in the future what people could be told is if you don't turn up, you may, you may have to answer to that at some time in the future. I mean, surely planning is more than just dealing with the technicalities from their perspective. I'm not blaming the staff here at all. It is up to them to turn up, but I find this unacceptable. I'm not happy about it, and I hope that it doesn't happen in the future. Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, <clears throat> I absolutely agree. I, you know, I think it, uh, it, it, it demonstrates, a, you know, a lack of interest in the process, and uh, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with the mayor. I think it, uh, you know, and even, even uh, agreeing to a deferral or a, a flat out, uh, you know, turn the, turn the motion down, and then I'll, that'll give them a kick in the butt and get them down here. So uh, I, uh, I like where Mary Easton's going on this. I've had other situations where I've asked that question myself, where is the delegation? And uh, you know there are there are minim, minimal numbers of residential properties that we have available to develop, and you would think that uh, if uh, they were interested in uh, getting this thing approved, they'd be here to talk to us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any other comments, Councillor Foster? I guess through the staff, um, you know, no, not to uh, like belabor this point because, you know, there have been councils in the past that have actually dealt with some of these issues and went through very thorough public processes and have got ourselves to some of these stages. But I'm just curious through to Mrs. Dale, like this to me seems more like a housekeeping item than, than necessarily, um, you know, something that we need to be getting up and marching down the streets and complaining about. So I'm, I'm just curious, like, how does staff look at this particular request that's coming forward at this point? Mrs. Dale. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, because of the age of this plan of subdivision, there was no specific condition that we can put in place in the subdivision agreement requiring things like certain house designs, facade design guidelines, those types of things. Um, so at this point, um, as I mentioned, it is, it is more or less a technical approval. We're asking um, committee and council to approve the subdivision agreement, which is the end of the process. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question um, to you, Mrs. Dale. Um, how many more of these should we expect that may be in this same scenario that um, don't have the necessity or the requirement to come forward with these detailed details that the mayor and, and other councillors are looking for. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, um, this is probably one of the last ones um, because on a go forward basis um, for all site plan applications, staff are asking for this. Um, when people are going through plans of subdivision or zoning amendment applications, we're asking for more visuals from the applicants um, to help um, committee and council understand what it's going to look like. Okay. Thank you. Um, for, I've, I've got. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go here first, and then I'll be back to you. So just, so just if um, um, now, where I think the mayor and and Councillor McPherson might be coming from, and I think is a perfectly valid 
comment that we should be bringing forward is that, you know, some of these things languish for a long time. And I mean, I totally agree that, that they shouldn't be. Um, you know, the, but the way that planning rules, et cetera, are in place, you know, we, we don't have a lot of control over that, but certainly we need to be, you know, uh, putting the pitchfork underneath these guys every once in a while to get moving forward. This one has been going around this council for a long time. Um, um, and there were very valid decisions made on it. Why they, why they haven't moved forward with the complete secondary or with all of this at this point in time, I don't know. I, I, there are reasons why developers do what they do, but I, uh, um, you know, I guess maybe, and you know, maybe it's going to have to be something that we look at from a planning point of view to make sure that we are prodding um, developers on and, and getting them to move forward as quick as they possibly can because I kind of agree it's not acceptable that it's, that it's dragged on as long as it has, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Kirkopoulos, then back to Councillor Timmers, and over to the Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to provide a brief, uh, brief comment to Council, and uh, let me start with, uh, with suggesting that um, you know, we're going to go back to all of the developers that we're dealing with and, and I think reconfirm uh, what this council's expectations are and, and I can tell you we've done that in the past uh, and we're seeing significantly more compliance with some of the renderings that people are coming back with. I would just caution council on this particular one while I understand the frustrations around the table. Not everybody's getting our message very clear. Uh, I don't... Uh, I don't see any grounds by which we're able to defer, and so I wouldn't want to enter into a into an area that, that possibly gets us in trouble, uh, and and without you know divulging too many details and, and seeking legal advice and going into camera to discuss it. I understand council's frustration on this. I understand that it's also one of those things. I think as as Councilor Foster highlighted, that is. Uh, housekeeping in nature. Uh, so, you know, I can assure you that uh, I'll continue to work with planning staff to ensure that we are informing each of the developers, but uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight that we are seeking significantly more and we and are seeing significantly more compliance from developers that come in with renderings and uh, every chance I get, I do mention that to ones who haven't come in with them. So uh, I think you're going to continue to see more more compliance with that, but on this one, I'd, I'd just caution. Uh, I understand the frustration, and we'll make sure that that is uh, incredibly clear uh, to this particular developer. Okay, thank you, Mr. CAO. Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you, Chair Thompson. I think uh, our CAO just answered it for me. I didn't um, realize, because it is such an old plan, of where this is where this is sitting today I think was a little I was a little unsure where we were going with this um, I guess I just need clarification of what the end the end product is going to be I'm a little concerned now what because we have no idea what's going to be put so we will have input still if we pass this motion we will have no input into what is going to be built on those lots is that already predetermined? And when did that happen? Director Dale. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure what, where we're okay. at in the process. Okay, so here. through you, Mr. Chairman, um, the property is draft approved right now um, and has zoning in place to permit the developer to build 21 single family homes. Um, and then there's also a storm detention block. Um, there are no, there's no provisions in place to to say, state that um, this house has to look like this or that house has to look like that. Um, what controls what the houses are going to look like are is basically the provisions of the zoning bylaw, which are setbacks, building height, those types of things. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Easton. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I wasn't suggesting a deferral, but I fully expect that we are going to see something that is a 20-year-old design because I have no reason to think of anything else but that. And I certainly was not challenging the decisions that took place to prepare this site in the appropriate manner, which I understand were quite extensive through that process, as Councillor Foster suggested earlier. However, I, I, I just... I guess I don't have any, there's nothing more that I can say to express to you the fact that I have no confidence in what this subdivision is going to look like. 
in this lovely little hamlet in our community. So I'll just leave it at that because I'm just getting more across and there's nothing that can be done about it and I do understand that. And I thank everyone for their conversation. Thank you. So I've already read the motion. Any questions to the motion? Your pleasure on the motion? Against the motion? Motion's carried. Next item on our agenda this evening is PL 1828, Residential Tenancies Act 2016, delegation to local municipalities regarding the residential rental maintenance standards. I have a motion moved by Mayor Easton and seconded by Councillor McPherson that for reasons outlined in PL 1823, it's hereby recommended that this report be received for information. Are there any questions to the report? Are there any questions to the motion? Committee's pleasure on the motion. And the motion is carried. <clears throat> Next report on the agenda this evening is PL 18-24. Draft Natural Heritage System, NHS mapping for the growth plan. I have a motion moved by Councillor McPherson, seconded by Mayor Easton, that this report, PL 18-24, be received as information. Are there any questions on the report from the committee? Are there any questions to the motion? Mayor Easton? Mr. Chairman, I don't want, um, this is a very, very important piece of legislation, and it's, it's very comprehensive, but it has the potential for being quite invasive, um, particularly to farmers. I, not, I don't think any of us know quite yet what that impact is going to be. However, I, I know that OMAFRA were heavily involved in the responses, and I think we have to rely on the farming community and their associations to, up, you know, to really bring those issues forward. Um, on the surface, in terms of the protection of um, our natural heritage, absolutely, it's extremely important and it's, it's particularly important for our community, there's no question. So um, I've read all the documents, I've read what OMAFRA submitted, um, I've heard a lot of the concerns raised by farmers that are involved, um, and again, we'll, we'll, time will out on it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any more questions to the report or the motion? The committee's pleasure on the motion. The motion's carried. Last report on the uh, on the agenda this evening is PL 18-25, the Residential Development Activity to December 31st, 2017. I have a motion moved by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor Timmers. The PL 18-25 including status sheets relating to all active residential developments in the town up to December 31st, 2017 be received f as information. Are there any questions or comments to the report? Councillor Foster. I always, uh, I, I always like asking this question back through to staff. Um, um, are we happy? Are we sad? Are we uh, are we looking at this saying we're moving in the right direction? We're <coughs> moving in the wrong direction. Um, um, either to you or Mr. Greedo here. No, but he anyway, is not. Um, um, uh, maybe I will through to our senior senior staff. Kathleen or Matt, which were you, which of you would like to respond? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, I think this really just shows that there's an awful lot of development activity in the town. I mean, this is just the residential component, but there is a lot of activity going on in the town. Thank you. Council, uh, do you have, or <laughs> committee, do you have any um, any questions to this motion? Committee's pleasure on the motion. Motion's carried. 
So all motions from this evening's meeting will pr be presented to council for final approval at its meeting of April 16th, 2018. Following council approval and enactment uh, of any bylaws that may be necessary, the town's decision will be complete and notice will be issued in accordance with the Planning Act. Councilor inquiries, are there any councilor inquiries this evening? Councilor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Council Inquiry with regards to the um, pond, the sewage pond that's being um, built on Jordan Road. And um, <clears throat> I came back from uh, a week's vacation to a email from a resident asking about uh, the pond and raising questions about uh, do we know you know, the impact of the pond as regards to um, potential for smell. Do we know uh, the impact of the pond for uh, potential to, uh, on the uh, on the water, uh, uh, the uh, floodplain? Uh, and quite honestly, I did not have any knowledge of the pond. So um, on investigation, uh, I have found that uh, this was an approval through a, a provincial agency, not sure who, uh, have heard from some it was a MAFRA, I heard from others it was the Ministry of Environment, I'm not sure. My concern is um, that we're in a, a, a fairly sensitive area within the town, you know, with, with uh, wineries, with uh, schools in the neighborhood, with residential in the neighborhood, and, and it's not, to my knowledge, a um, lane of manure for a couple of weeks and it goes away. You know, the potential here is that it, it will stay and that we will be dealing with, with whatever comes out of this and, and it seems to be yet to be determined what, what uh, the result will be. But I guess my question through um, you to the CAO or, or the director is, where are we going with this? Um, we have a number of residents that are are certainly um, asking questions uh, as to um, uh, is this something that we want in in that area? Um, there is also a question uh, with regards to where it was built or where it's being built in proximity proximity to the neighboring properties. So that, that is the question I would like to pose is uh, what course of action do we plan to take and uh, uh, how do we deal with what uh, may not amount to um, a significant issue, but I think uh, for the purposes of, you know, trying to take care of, of uh, our own neighborhoods and our own uh, residents, uh, we certainly need to get involved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. I'm gonna to go to the CAO for comments on this. Uh, three, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the opportunity uh, to provide some comments and uh, thanks to Councillor McPherson for uh, bringing this forward. Uh, this has been an issue that uh, we've been dealing with, I wanna say for the last two weeks, I think as the Councillor uh, highlighted when he came back from vacation, there's been a number of emails that a number of senior staff and members of council have received. Uh, it is multi-jurisdictional, I think as the councillor highlighted, um, specifically uh, from OMAFRA, so uh, Agricultural and Rural Affairs. Uh, there are a number of elements to it, uh, and a number of elements uh, as it relates specifically to this particular site, uh, which include uh, a biodigester on the site, as well as uh, a nutrient um, management plan that addresses particular elements on this farmer's land. So uh, I think the course of action that, that staff are recommending is really pulling all the parties together, getting representatives from OMAFRA, uh, our planning staff, uh, as well as the various parties together and determining some, some immediate next steps in terms of uh, what is uh, allowed on the site and what is not allowed on the site. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of, uh, I think differing perspectives on, on what that is, so we need to get some clarity, I think, first and foremost. Uh, so we'll be reaching out both to the uh, resident of this particular property, uh, as well as uh, neighboring properties, and, and again, trying to pull in all, all parties meeting together to try to get to uh, uh, the core of, uh, of what's going on on this particular site. Thank you, Mr. CAO. 
Councilor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm good with that. Thank you. Any other Councilor? Councilor Foster. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to follow up on uh, Councilor McPherson's comments and on this particular situation. And and it, it was interesting as, as I was looking at it as well. Like, we've been pretty clear as a municipality that, that we aren't particularly fussy about um, um, stuff coming in to Lincoln and being processed um, within our municipality. We went to the OMB on on one on an industrial piece of property. We, we fought another one that was going to be um, up on Zimmerman Road um, concerning um, um, you know, doing a variety of different things there as well. So I will be a little curious as we see what's going on with this particular application because if it turns out that this is kind of an industrial application that's going on with this, then all of a sudden there's a difference comes into play with this. I mean, um, you know, hauling in things from elsewhere and doing it and, and moving on, you know, like, you know, there, there's kind of a difference between what we would call straight agriculture and all of a sudden industrial agriculture. And so, you know, I, I will be curious to see as exactly what it is that we see with this as we're going along. So, um, so I'm glad Councillor McPherson brought it up this evening. Thank you, Councillor. Certainly I've been hearing as well about this. Um, sort of runs along the same lines as what you uh, opposed at uh, AMO with regards to greenhouse and industrial and so on and so forth. So anyway, it should be very interesting to hear from staff on this. Mayor Easton, please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my inquiry is about cannabis legislation. And um, we do have um, a, a number, I won't say a huge number, but certainly the impact um, that people are experiencing from the skunk smell that comes from the greenhouses that don't have any venting, proper um, scrubbing devices and uh, filters is, is really becoming a major issue. So I noticed in the municipal world that there was an article in there which outlined to some, uh, to really quite an extent, the legislation, legislative pieces that would be important for municipalities to be proactive about. So my question to, um, through you to the CAO is, I believe we have a plan in pl place. I, I would like to know, um, I think it's important for everybody to hear what that plan is. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. CAO. Three, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think similar to uh, the response I, I gave you before, uh, and, and, and not to be uh, humorous in any way, it, this is one of these issues that uh, we are looking at bringing OMAFRA to the table as well as the MOE and determining from an odor perspective because that seems to be the biggest issue that we're facing, what it is we can do and, and, and where we have some of those jurisdictional um, uh, authorities to be able to do something. There are some uh, responsibilities that as a municipality from a property standards we currently have and we're currently able to employ from uh, from what we're able to do and not able to do. Uh, you know, and I think um, it is multi-jurisdictional and not only at a provincial level or at a federal level, but also on the various agencies uh, at, a, at a more municipal level. So public health has been involved in this particular matter, Niagara Regional Police Services, and we shared with council uh, and have up on our website uh, some information as it relates to kind of who does what around cannabis, but I can tell you uh, Mr. Deany and Mr. Bruder uh, are working with, uh, with other staff to pull that meeting together with uh, MOE and uh, OMAFRA. Uh, now I know MAFRA is is hoping uh, to wait until they see uh, in more detail a little bit of the legislation before they weigh into uh, what it is they can and can't do from a prohibition standpoint as it relates to odor. So uh, we are on it. Um, you know we have been reaching out to MAFRA for a number of weeks and, and months now uh, to seek input and and to determine uh, what it is we can start sharing with the community on this particular item. And so we will continue to keep council updated, but. Uh, we do have some information out there. We will continue to share some information. I see Mr. Edwards there taking detailed notes. So, um, I, you know, I suspect, uh, you know, this topic will, will, will garner significant media attention, not just here, but, but across the region. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Kokopoulos. Um, the um, difference between an existing greenhouse where these products are being grown um, I think I have a pretty clear idea of what we 
can and cannot do until we get further instruction from the province. However, what would the process be if uh, a new operation was to be was to be built? Do we have those bylaws in place? Do we what? I don't understand which process. What process would be used beyond um, beyond the planning for a greenhouse? Is there any part of that that even discusses the crop that that would be grown or the limitations, uh, the setbacks, and the limitations to have scrubbers and uh, and um, um, filters? I don't know if and I don't need an answer tonight, yeah. really. I'm just okay. looking for more information because there seems to be more questions than answers, so I'll just leave it at that. Certainly, I would uh, request staff dig up the information if possible to bring back a later date. Are there any other councillor inquiries this evening? Any announcements this evening? There's no closed sessions, so being that there's no further business, I call this meeting adjourned.